So the potential is huge. You have bamboo that grows wild, yeah? I yeah, mean, it would be my fondest dream to be able to sell it because it's just a scourge. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's threatening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Welcome to What Would Our Kupuna Do? This is Richard Haw's blog, which looks at what we can do today to make Hawaii Island a more sustainable place to live so our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren won't be priced out of here and will be able to stay in Hawaii and live good lives here. So today, this is kind of fun, Richard. Uh, we thought we'd talk about this tour that we did the other day of your farm, and it was really neat. So first of all, tell me how this came about. Well, you know, we have a monthly meeting of, of the Bamboo Hui, and uh, they started to talk about a pilot project. I told them what we had going up on the farm of modern day Ahupua, how we were receptive to something like this. So they started talking about the idea of some kind of bamboo processing facility, right? Yeah. What a fascinating idea here on the Hamakua Coast where bamboo grows like green grass. I mean, yeah. astonishing. Why is no one doing that already, I wonder? You know, it's so fascinating. I was in bananas for all these years. And you had to fertilize them and you had to spray for diseases and all this kind of stuff. The bamboo, you know, we planted some on our property and I just watched it grow. Nobody did anything. It just went crazy. And I just drive by people's places. They have it in the backyard or wherever they have it. And it's just going. It's a weed. It, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it would be amazing to have a bamboo processing facility here. I'm surprised no one's done it before. But anyway, so you were talking about that and then you decided to bring them up to the farm and, and show them sort of the big picture of what you're doing there. Thank you for inviting me. I realize you and I have worked together for many, many years now and I've been to the farm quite a few times, but I had never taken a tour of the whole thing. So it was really interesting to me too, to see all that. And what sort of reaction did you find from them about the bamboo processing facility? What, what are they saying? Oh, that is so fascinating because we didn't know much about it until just recently, uh, until when they talk, started talking about a pilot plant. Oh, okay. Now, what does that look like? And one of the most important pieces of information was the fact that bamboo is being made uh, using tissue culture. And tissue culture is right down uh, Bruce Matthews, you know, alley. He, he knows that stuff like backwards and forward. What that allows is stable genetics oh, and massive volume. Because if you want to do something that has the scale to compete on the world market, you've got to have some scale. And I'm not saying that all the bamboo growers got to be big because to help the local farmers, we, we're trying to get them a multiple income sheet. So let's say they have a 10 acre plot and they have one acre of bamboo. If they set it up in such a way that they can harvest it, you know, just real carefully and it doesn't fall get stuck in the other trees but in such a way that they can cut it up into eight feet pieces because that's the standard piece and then have it delivered to the processing area make it so efficient it was, it was like when we planted bananas bananas used to be like this you'd plant uh, 250 banana plants in an acre and then let four grow then you get a thousand then we changed it we put a thousand in straight rows and then that left the, the center open if you mowed it or if you put it a little bit wider so that the shade repress the grass but allowing the moisture to rise, then you could travel with vehicles in between. So it's the same principle. Now, instead of putting clumps, put them in straight rows and wide enough apart so that when you harvest, it doesn't hurt you. And it makes it real easy to harvest and distribute because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the whole family involved, the kids and everybody. Doing it smarter, making it easy, making yeah, it yeah. sensible and practical. And I've had a sit down with HPM to talk to them about what is the potential for that? What what are the regulations you got to meet? And so now we understand what the regulations are. It's got to be real predictable. Quality has got to be solid. So you wouldn't do it the old way where you just uh, stick it in the water and then you heat it up up and stuff like that. What you need to do is you need to put it through a pressure machine. And what that does is it knocks out all the sugar because the sugar that attracts the insects, you know, like termites and stuff like that. What you want to do is take that all out and then you cut them up into pieces and then you squeeze them and, and then you join them together and glue them together and you end up with two by fours and stuff like that. So you're not talking about a bamboo house. You're talking about the structural pieces replacing wood and because it's produced here and not have to be brought from somewhere else using oil to get here now this can make a big difference for future generations cheaper yeah. housing make food and uh, that kind of stuff so that's the bigger picture yeah yeah amazing yeah so first of all we had to find a place to meet yeah so we gave instructions how to get to the place where our gate is it's called the ha gate because there's that thing in the gate that says ha the ha gate i didn't realize till we got there and i looked at it you had a metal gate made 
that the guy yeah. actually incorporated the the last name Ha into the metal, right? I thought that was so cool. Yeah, yeah no kid, you know, and I had no idea he was going to do that. But he did, did it in such a way to reinforce the gate. So, you know, the letters, you know, H and A was set up in such a way to support the structure. <laughs> that was really neat. So we, we met there and just talked about where we were right next to Aliyah stream, which was the stream that used to supply Pipike with all its water and described what we were going to do. Basically, we had a meeting prior to that, and it was the Pipike Community Association meeting. At that meeting, there was a discussion about the possibility of doing a bypass road around Makea Bridge, which is on Kopakoya Homestead Road. It goes over Makea Stream, but it's a temporary bridge, one car at a time. And so the folks on the bottom were concerned that there would be too much traffic going through their neighborhood. The folks on the top were, of course, concerned about getting out. So both of them asked me if I'd be receptive to using our property to put a temporary bypass road and coming out the Ha Gate. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, it depends on you folks. If you folks want to do that, I'm for it. Because it would go into our uh, idea of a vegetable production food hub. If it's right on the side of a paved road, it'll make it so much easier for area farmers. So we, we were there at the gate and I gave them that description. And then what we did was we came down and we went over the bridge and then we went out to where the cross-country road is. It's a cross-country road that touches Kalpakoya Homestead Road above Makia Bridge. And so we started talking about what was on the side of the road, 25 acres on the right side, 25 acres on the left side. On the left side, 25 acres, there's a big, oh, about a 2 million gallon reservoir that you can't really tell because, you know, we hadn't used it for so long. It was full of weeds and trees growing in front of it. And then on the right side, there's uh, another 25 acres. And then along the side of that road, you could see four-inch pipes sticking out of the ground. And what that was, was we had a water system that came from the springs above, and we used that water to grow hydroponic vegetables. And that's why the land is so flat, because we made it flat. You would have a hard time figuring out why it was like that, just without anybody saying. And now you can see people are growing sweet potato there, because the farmer that's growing sweet potato has a contract lease arrangement until October. At the end of October, then he'll leave and go back and work on other parts of our property. Then we'll be able to lease it out to interested farmers. So then we came up to a, a road that was like a T. We came straight up and then there was a cross country road that went from right to left on Kapokuea Homestead Road all the way across. And it's a plantation road. You know, it's a, a solid base. We stopped several places along the road. Yeah, we just stopped wherever it felt. Right. And the weather was so nice. So we could stop any place. Yeah. <laughs> It was a beautiful day. I enjoyed it so much. And I heard so many of the things we've been talking about in these videos. You pointed out the electrical poles that carry the power for your hydroelectric. We talked about the sugar cane that is growing wild along the way. And Bruce Matthews, he was looking at the sugar cane and gave us all kinds of interesting history. He knew, just looking at this, he knew this one was from this year and it was good for this. And what yeah. else? You talked about the fiddle wood and the mm. guinea grass and the sugar cane as being the pests that are keeping you from being able to see the lay of the land and the waterways. And I really got a sense of that as we went through. Yeah. It was like illustration of everything we've ever talked about here on this. And, and you know what is really interesting? Until I started actually physically doing the work, and I wanted to do it myself because we needed to take care of the guinea grass first. And the guinea grass, what it does is it grows six, seven feet tall and it blocks your view totally. So in order for you to get a good assessment of what you have, you got to knock them down. As as I do it, I start to get more and more familiar with the details of why you do what you do and why farmers do what they do. It's a tremendous experience of hands-on on the ground. Yeah. We stop where the uh, spring, the first spring, crosses the road, the cross-country road. Yeah. So if you stop there, you look carefully where I knock the guinea grass back, you can see how much water is coming down. Once you see how much water is coming down, you tell yourself, holy smokes, you mean that's coming from a spring just up the road? And start to imagine what can you do with it? And what you can do with it is is, you know, now the federal government is very concerned about the quality of the water that you use to grow the food. So now where the spring starts and you do a concrete encasement and stick pipes into it, now all of a sudden the water that you're using, which we want to connect into our old hydroponic system, will be totally controlled. So it'll come out perfectly like what's coming out of the ground. And that water is already analyzed. You know, they know what the pH of the water is. They know the chemical content is very stable and something like that, I'm sure, will be clear to use for planting. And the rule I'm talking about only happened within the last two weeks that they're oh, saying that this is going to be 
what the, the federal government is setting as a standard. So you saw, yeah, the water coming down, going under the road. That's amazing. Something? And also what's amazing is to realize that well, that water runs all year long. That's great. Yeah. And people don't actually take a step back and understand why this happens. There's about 16 of these perpetual spring streams coming off of Mauna Kea. What happens is, in general, the wind blows in from the ocean, northeast trees, pushes it against the mountain, squeezes the water out of it. The water drops down and goes into the land. Oh, that's interesting. And then it pops up in 16 streams. But you can't see them because the plants want the water so much. They grow so thick, you can't even see the water. You know, when you're driving along Highway 19, yeah? That's what I, we're trying to do is to make it visible so people can understand what the resource looks like. And then what can we do with this resource? I find it really fascinating, you know, to have pushed the guinea grass back so much so you can actually see the stream spring water going under that road. So we stopped, talked about it a little bit and then talked about sugarcane. Then we moved on further down. We crossed one more spring. We have two of those springs on our property. It goes into Makea Stream on our property. So the rules and regulations about utilizing the water for those uh, streams are totally under our control because it happens on our property. So then we drive up further and there's a Leah Stream. Alia Stream is the one that we're talking about that used to supply Pepe Kill. And then we looked at that and same thing, you know, opening it up and knocking some of the bigger trees that are covering so you can't see anything. Then we went up further and um, at that point is where the cross-country road hooks up with that Hoggate Road and then goes back down to Pave Road. But if you continue on to the right, there's the water department well. And what is interesting about that was they are located where they were always located. But at the start, they used Alia Stream from the spring. But then they got their water more dependable by drilling a well. So now the water that goes to Pepeke is all well water. The background to it is that, you know, we worked with the community right down the road. And because we worked in the transition, Brewer gave us the three acres where Alia Stream originates from. So at some point, we were going to figure out how to utilize it. So we went out there, looked at where the water system starts, and right. then we came down. But what is interesting about it is, as you go up the road, you can't see anything right or left because it's so thick. But once you break out of that, you can then see the hydroelectric plant that we have. And you also can see a little neighborhood that was just built, self-help housing. And then you can see Pu'u Alala where the, the radar stations are. And then you can see the quarry, yeah? yeah? So you can see everything. And if you go just a further down the road, your total view is blocked. So in a real quick way, you can see everything if all of those things were down. So, you know, I was able to explain that we're going to take it all down so right. we can see what we have. Yeah, that sounds so basic, but until you look at it and realize, no, this is huge to clear this and actually have full use of the land and, and see what's going on there. It's kind of huge. I got it when I saw it all. Yeah. We went up to go to see why Ama stream. You remember we, we that went was up over there and walked alongside? That was beautiful. Was, oh, wasn't that something? Walk run across it? The yep. 100 year old flu, and you stand yep. there on the left side is brand new where we set it up so that the big pipe came down to run the hydro. And then the other part of it was 100 years old and mm -hmm. how they had it so that they could divert water one way or the other just by putting slats of woods in, in there. So we went across there, kind of rickety. You know, I got to change that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was rickety, I have to say. I thought <laughs> yeah. twice about putting my feet on those boards, but it worked yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And then we were walking up there. Now, now, people probably are as amazed as I am that it was sitting there for 100 years and the water is coming down in this flume made of just soil. And that has been there for 100 years. Yeah. So we're walking on the side. That we planted tea leaf on one side. So in case you lose your balance, you can grab onto the tea leaf. Yeah. I didn't oh, realize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we went, we went and walked up, and then we could see the stream itself, why Alma stream itself. Right. And uh, we got a chance to talk story and, and explain how all these things are and what we're going to do in the future and stuff like that. I know it made a huge impact on the people. They were just so fascinated because this is not very many people get to see something like that, you know, yep. 100 years old, you know, yep. that kind of thing. It was just yeah. beautiful up there. Well, we came back and then tried to absorb everything, and then we drove back down. Now, when we drove back down, we went by the hydroelectric plant, and I asked them, oh, you folks want to see that? Because, you know, the hydroelectric plant is not very sophisticated. We had the flume. We wanted to make electricity. We knew they were generating electricity on the west side, on the corner side. So I just talked to the engineers who brought those in and asked them if they could bring one up for us. 
And he said, oh, yeah, no problem. And then they sent them in from Washington. <laughs> and then yeah. they put it in place. What is that they sent? You know that 20-foot container with the hydro generator inside? That all came in one container. Oh. We just parked it on the spot and hooked everything up to it. Yeah, And then nice. hooked up the electricity. We got electricians from over here to set up the electrical system and send it all the way over to where our banana packing house used to be. And then we generated our own electricity. We were saving something like $16,000 a month, you know, in electricity bills. That's because of your big refrigerated uh, coolers. And it's yeah. like, yeah, that's an, an yeah. enormous amount of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They were really interested in seeing that. You're right. It's very simple looking. It doesn't look fancy and it's kind of small, but but what a remarkable thing. And it yeah. got a lot of interest from these people on the tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the way back to turn right to get down and follow the proposed paved road down, there's a four acre parcel there that's fenced in. And that's where we would do a food hop. And it just so happens that right close to it is the two inch pipe that Seabrewer gave to us and the water department let us have, yeah? Perfect. So that water can be used for that, the food hold right there. And our hydroelectric generates electricity and that goes right by that place. What ideas do you have for this food hub? What would that be? What we wanted to do was set up a uh, food safety program because if you're going to sell it commercially to the big retailers, you need to have a food safety program. So our food safety program will be based around oxygenated water, ozonated water, they call that, yeah? The water is in O3 form. So oxygen wants to stay in the O2 form. So it's a temporary, O3 is temporary. And one of the oxygen molecules wants to leave. And the way it works is that it happens to attach to the bad stuff. That's why it's so popular. It just turns to water. There's no leftover in anything. So it's USDA approved and people like that kind of a system better than uh, radiation. But, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So that'll allow a food hub like ours sell to any of the retailers. And then the retailers could just send their truckers up to come because now there's a paved road. They can pick it up and go. So are you thinking um, sort of a cooperative thing where people come in and bring their products? Or is it things that are grown on your farm? Or is it a combination? You know, I would like to see anybody growing anything in the area that can find it convenient to reach up there for a, uh, a place to do the processing. And hopefully it'll be something like a co-op where the farmers own the operation. And the reason for it is it keeps the, the value within the community. Yeah. That's terrific. And then just... Further up the road is where we're thinking of the bamboo processing. This is yeah. a nice area that is kind of set up that would be perfect. So those two operations can be set up there. So we're looking at those two. That really gave a good picture of what a modern day ahupua'a might look like, right? Mm -hmm. Taking the traditional concept of the ahupua'a and using it in modern ways. I mean, it was very illustrative. It was really neat to see that. And boy, the people on this tour, the bamboo people, they were very interested. There, was, there wasn't anybody just politely walking along. It, it was a really fun day. People were really into it. I know. It made me so happy. There's so many people that are so talented. You know? We need to touch bases with them to have everybody, whatever the area of interest, try to figure out how it is we're going to incorporate what their area of expertise is because we need everybody's brain power. I see you talking to groups of people and you're so good at getting other people involved to have the expertise and really, you know, sharing information and not trying to do it all on your own. And it's much stronger mm. for that. You're really good at that. I'm impressed by that. Yeah, that's a strength there yeah, is, is in the group. Mm. You get stronger the bigger the group. Yeah, if everybody has a place in it and they feel like they have an, some ownership. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, I got to say. <laughs> it was great. Thank you again for including me because I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed enjoyed the people and I enjoyed seeing the, the big picture of your farm and hearing the big picture of the modern day Ahupua'a and all the things you're doing. It was just great. I was so happy yeah. to be here. So thanks. Good, good fun. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Well, thanks, Richard. And thanks everybody for watching. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of What Would Our Kupuna Do? And Ahuiho. <laughs>